Well, we've just sung some amazing words, haven't we? And it's quite almost emotional for a true believer to, to sing about Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose blood can wash away the foulest sin. But there's a similar thought in a more modern lyrics uh, that will equally infuse our hearts if we truly love our Lord Jesus Christ and have been experienced that wonderful privilege of cleansing. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saved by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm so glad. By His grace I have been touched. By His word I have been healed. By His hand I've been delivered. By His Spirit I've been sealed. And the the song goes on. Not by works, but by faith in Him who called. And I'm so glad. I just want to thank you, Lord. So they, those words reflect how I feel. I've been saved. Not by works or anything good that I could possibly have done, but only through Jesus Christ, through faith in the Lamb of God who shed his blood to redeem us, to wash us clean. Desperately needy people, like all of us, can be wonderfully cleansed in the blood of of the Saviour, that fountain of of blessing. Now, those words I just quoted, I don't know what they mean to to Bob Dylan, who penned them. As far as I can tell, I did a little bit of research, it seems that he hasn't performed that track publicly since 1981. But he has performed other tracks with similar words. So is there a reason for such a long lapse? I didn't know, I don't know but it might be connected to something John MacArthur preached about at the end of last year. And uh, there's a popular YouTube sermon, well over a million views, and based around largely John chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus is explaining to his his earthly half-brothers why he's hated And it seems so strange, doesn't it, that this man, Jesus, who spent his time doing good, showing love, offering peace, pardon and forgiveness, and yet he's hated. It doesn't make sense. So Jesus says, he says in John 7, verse 7, the world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Now, that's something that people just don't want to be told, do they? That their works are evil. And yet, it's a truth clearly revealed in the Bible. It's the doctrine of of total depravity. None of us is born good. We have this natural tendency towards doing what's wrong. And it affects every aspect of us. That's why it's called total. Every facet of our being is impaired. There's our consciences, thinking, desires, our wills. We're damaged people, sinfully inclined away from God from the day of our birth. Now, who wants to be told that? Our pride kicks in. I'm a decent person. Perhaps not perfect, certainly not evil. And yet Jesus, and we know his every word is true, he says, the world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. And according to that uh, sermon by John MacArthur, it's He entitled it The Most Hated Christian Doctrine because we're quite happy convincing ourselves that we're essentially good and noble and upright, but God says, no, that's not true. Unless Jesus changes us, well, our prospects are gloomy indeed. And so that's why, as Christians, we get so excited about salvation. It's such good news. We're so glad because we were completely lost. We were dead dead in sin, incapable of of saving ourselves in any way whatsoever, but Jesus Christ has broken into our lives and done everything for us. He's done everything necessary. We're saved by the blood of the Lamb, and we're so glad. We know where we were, and we rejoice at this wonderful change. So that's a, a key theme for us this morning, the glorious privilege of belonging to God's people. And our passage is 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 8. But just for a moment, back to Bob Dylan. How does that song start? 
don't know if anyone knows, but it starts with total deprav depravity. I was blinded by the devil, born already ruined, stone cold dead as I stepped out of the womb. And it just ties in with, with Scripture. Psalm 51, David says, this is in the NET version, look, David says, I was guilty of sin from birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. So, the Bible teaches that we're, we're born sinful, and yet we continue in sin. Genesis 6, verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. As Dylan puts it, we're born already ruined, stone cold dead as we stepped out of the womb. So what do you make of that imagery? Stone cold dead. Well, what's more lifeless than a stone? It's deader than a dodo. We start out life like dead stones, but Peter is so encouraging, so much good news here, because he tells us that we can be living stones, verse 5. In fact, we're already like that because he's writing to Christians. If you're a true believer, you're a living stone. And I get quite excited about that imagery in these verses. Maybe I let my imagination run wild a bit, but we're t God is taking these living stones and building us into a spiritual building, a spiritual house, we're told. And uh, you just think about it, there's lots of bricks here. So I imagine in this great spiritual building that, that God's building, that all of you, faithful ones, will be all together somewhere. You'll be next to each other. And if you're living stones, you'll have arms, you'll be around each other, you'll be caring for each other. And maybe there's a, a dead stone. We had one, a dead stone, now it becomes a living stone. So what would you say if you're up there somewhere? You'll probably say, squeeze over, here's someone to join us, take my hand. I want you near me, I want to help you and encourage you and build you up. Now I know that I'm a, a rather dodgy stone, I guess. Um, I'm not really what I should be. But the good news is that there are other people in my fellowship, particularly Pastor Paul Oliver, he was here a few weeks ago. He's always preaching, but also coming alongside me and rebuking, rebuking me sometimes, more often than he should, I'm sure. But we care for each other, don't we? And hopefully you've got people here that are doing the same for you, encouraging you, rebuking you, but most of all, pointing you to God's word and to Jesus Christ. So it's this wonderful picture we have here that of dead stones becoming alive because of Jesus and then being added to this amazing building. Now, it's, our theme is basically God's remarkable building. And I guess we should start with the foundation. So if you look at verse 4 with an eye, an eye on verse 3, you can see that we're coming. There's the key word there. As you come, we're coming to the Lord, the Lord Jesus. That's just another way of saying those who come to Jesus are true believers. Wayne Grudem gives the sense of those verses. He says, as you continually come to Christ, because it's present tense, as you continually come to him in initial faith, then in worship and prayer, you're yourselves being built into a spiritual house. So we have to come initially through faith, believing in Jesus, trusting him as our only saviour, our only hope because of his, his finished work upon the cross. But it doesn't stop there. We keep on coming. As true believers, we, we keep on trusting, we keep on exercising faith. But in addition to just believing, we can also worship and pray. There's so much more, as we'll see later, so much more that we can do. And verse 4, how's Jesus described? Well, he's also a living stone. He's like us in one sense, but not really just like us. Because, verses 6 and 7, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the vitally important foundation stone. He's the head of the corner. And it's been described as a massive cornerstone placed at the upper corner of the building to, in order to bind the walls 
firmly together. Jesus is the firm foundation. For our sins, his blood atones. He's the rock, the mighty fortress. Jesus is the living stone. That's wonderful. And Peter uses two extremely significant words. Again, back to verse 4. This vitally important stone is in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So Jesus is chosen by God and he's precious. Precious in the sense the original conveys the idea of highly valued or honoured. I think I would go with the idea of honour. Jesus is so honoured. Now, what's the most significant building in the Old Testament? Well, I guess, I imagine it has to be Solomon's temple. We read in 1 Kings 5, verse 17, At the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. So you can picture there these workmen. They're looking for these great, wonderful stones. Huge, great foundation stone would be extremely costly. You have to find it, you have to prepare it, transport it. But it's just a dead stone. Jesus, we're told, is the living stone. Why, why do you think? Why do you think Jesus is described as living? Well, probably because he's alive, isn't he? But more significantly, I think, it's because he's alive from the dead. Because Christ's death and resurrection are central to everything. He died in our place, bearing the wrath God's law demanded. He paid the penalty. Our sins deserve that punishment. Christ took the punishment and he destroyed death. And he destroyed the one who has the power of death. That's Satan. So Christ's death is immeasurably consequential. His death is so consequential, but in a sense, it's his resurrection that encourages us most, doesn't it? Because by rising from the dead, he proclaims total victory. The price is paid. He's truly conquered. It's the guarantee that we too will rise. So in Christ and through Christ and because of Christ, we have this everlasting life. Christian, you may remember at the beginning of Pilgrim's Progress, he's overwhelmed when he hears the good news. Nothing is going to distract him. So what are we told? He puts his fingers in his ears and he runs. He runs joyously crying, life, life, eternal life. Have you ever sung that? Have you danced through the streets, overcome with emotion? There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved, unto him who was nailed to the tree. That's the wonderful good news. Jesus is the living stone because he has life in himself and he grants life to those who come to him to those who, who put their faith in him. So he's altogether precious. We're living stones because Jesus, the ultimate living stone, has granted us that life. And he's chosen. Remember that, those words that describe Jesus? He's chosen. He's set apart. He's the only one, the one and only one who alone was sufficient for such a role. He's bearing the sin of the world, that great weight of humanity's transgression crushing down on Christ. None but Almighty God taking our nature. It needed to be a, the God-man. The perfect God-man could accomplish eternal redemption for undeserving men and women. So this is grace upon grace, unfathomable love. It's incomprehensibly wonderful. So what a cornerstone. We're thinking of Jesus as the cornerstone. It's a glorious foundation. How marvellous is God's remarkable building. And it's only possible because of Jesus. Jesus is the firm foundation. For our sins, his blood atones. He's the rock, the mighty fortress. Jesus is the living stone. So, is he your living stone? 
Are you part of his ever-expanding, everlasting, gloriously wonderful spiritual house? Or maybe you're still a dead stone. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with God's choice for the foundation. I've got better ideas. Now, Jesus, we're told, is chosen. He's chosen by God. He's God's choice. But actually, you might be saying, actually, he wouldn't be my choice. I wonder if there's any thinking like that this morning. That's what we have in verses 4 and 7. The builders rejected that Jesus as the cornerstone. They didn't want Jesus. In their thinking, he didn't really measure up. They were looking for a cornerstone, it says, but they rejected the one that God had chosen. They had their own ideas. We'll build our future on another foundation. But we know there's no other foundation. Christ is chosen by God. So, come to him. We're told, aren't we? Come, join this ever-growing, ever-expanding, everlastingly glorious, wonderful, spiritual house that God's building. So because Christ is the living stone, we can be living stones. So what Jesus has and what we experience are, are intertwined. If we come to him, if we belong to him, then he gives us what he is. It's amazing. And there's also, in verse 7, something... Uh, it's almost beyond belief, I guess. And uh, it says there, at least in the original, different Bible versions don't always pick it up. But in this ESV that we're looking at, you have these wonderful words. So the honour is for you who believe. Do you get that? Remember a moment ago we said that Jesus was honoured, precious in the sense of honoured, because he's honoured, we're honoured. Those of us who trust in Jesus, we're honoured. The honour is for you who believe. It's amazing. Because what Jesus has and what we have, remember, are intertwined. So his honour becomes our honour. His life becomes our life. It's amazing. So I get really quite excited about, especially that truth. It's, it's kind of disguised in some versions and, and they give the honour to, to Christ in both verses, four and seven. But here, it seems, looking at the, the commentaries, it definitely seems that the honour is for us, because Christ has the honour, we can share in that honour. Verse six, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. It's emphatic. We will never be put to shame. We'll be honoured. In the original, there's two consecutive negatives. It's not not put to shame. We receive great honour. Now, we don't always feel it, do we, at the moment? Do you feel honoured? I don't know. The secular worldview is so diametrically opposed to everything that seems to be true and good and upright. Our culture's had this seismic shift, and it's disturbing for true Christians. But woe to you. Woe to you if you dare to challenge uh, the unbiblical secular orthodoxy, Mary Ham. She describes what can easily happen. I don't know if you've had this happen to you, but if you uphold biblical truth, uh, then society will often say to you, you're a hater. You are the haterest hater that ever hated, and you'll shut up now. Now, is that easy to hear as a Christian? We're filled with love. That's what characterise, characterises us. And yet, to the world, all too often, we're seen as hateful. Remember, we're honoured by God. It doesn't promise that we'll be loved by everyone in this world. If you're of the world, Jesus says, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So we were once dead stones, we're now alive. We're in God's spiritual house. We're being abundantly blessed. But what happened to Jesus? He was singled out on this earth for great shame. John Calvin makes a quite a striking point, which you might have thought about before, I guess. But he's talking about Christ's crucifixion. 
And he says, as if the severity of the punishment had not been sufficient of itself. The barbaric cruelty of, of crucifixion. If that wasn't severe enough, Christ is hanged in the midst between two robbers as if he not only had deserved to be classed with other robbers, but had been the most wicked and the most detestable of them all. That's the way the world sees Jesus. The most detestable person. And he's overflowing with love and compassion. But where's Jesus now? He's crowned with glory and honour. And one day, every knee will bow. Those who rejected him, as we read, the builders rejected Christ. Well, they too will be rejected, sadly, and pushed away from God's presence. Now, in the meantime, Jesus still, God through Christ, is still adding stones to his building. Living stones keep being added every day. So we need to look a little bit more closely at this building, God's remarkable building. Now, it's clearly a temple. How do we know it's a temple? Well, that word house, it's not called a temple strictly, it's called a house. But a house is often used to refer to the temple. For example, back in the Old Testament, 1 King 6, the house that King Solomon built for the Lord. He's talking about the temple. It was to be 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. And even in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, when he'd driven those uh, people out of the temple who were desecrating it, he says, my house, house, referring to the temple, shall be called a house of prayer. And it's referred to as a spiritual house because it's, it's the Holy Spirit who moves in this house. Holiness is fundamental. And we know that the temple is often described as the, the holy temple. And particularly, focus in verse 5 on our function. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're priests. And clearly priests and sacrifices are intimately linked to temple worship. So God is building us into a temple. So why did Peter not just call us a temple? Why does he use the word house? Well, maybe because house has a double meaning. When we talk about the house of Jacob, for example, we're referring to Jacob's family, the community who belonged to Jacob, not to a building. And one commentator puts it like this, the double meaning of house allows an easy shift from the temple image to the community it houses. And that's where, for Christians, that gets really exciting. Because as true believers, we have a wonderful job. We're priests. It's the priesthood of all believers. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, you had to be not only a Levite, you had to be of the descendant of Aaron to be a priest. If you were born, for example, at the tribe of Reuben, tough luck. You'd never be belong to the priesthood. But for every true Christian, what do we read? We're a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be a priest in God's temple? Well, it's wonderful. It's an honour. It's a privilege. Why are we there? We're there to reflect God's holiness. And we're also to offer spiritual sacrifices. So what could they be? What, 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 what do you think spiritual sacrifices are? Well, certainly not animals, because Jesus, the Lamb of God, we sung, has, has been offered up once for all, the perfect sacrifice for sin. So the blood of bulls and goats could never deal with sin, but ultimately. But Jesus Christ, by his death, has permanently produced a, a full forgiveness for all who come in faith. So what sacrifices are you offering? What sort of things do you think you're, you're doing day by day as believers? Well, we're told to present our, our bodies as living sacrifices. So what specifically does that mean? Well, there should be praise. Hebrews 13 says, that verse 15, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. But we're not just sitting around uh, using words all the time. There should be action as well. The next verse, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. 
for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So there's words, praise, actions, helping others. And the psalmist says we to continually offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and prayer. May my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So as priests, we're going to be very busy, aren't we? Praising, worshipping God, hard at work, serving others. And it all begins with repentance and humility. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So we're offering our whole selves to God. One writer says, it's the wholehearted consecration of heart, mind, will, words, and deeds. That's quite a lot. That's everything, isn't it? But then he goes on to say, in fact, of all, one is, of all that one is, has, and does, we're offering that to God. So here's a question for all of us. Are you a fully functioning priest in God's temple? Is that you? Praising God. Hard at work, offering every aspect of your being for his glory. It's remarkable to be, to be living stones. We can do so much. We're to be here in this world promoting God's glory. Now, how can, how's that possible? Because you just have to look at us, at least look at myself primarily. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a jaggedy stone. We're all rough and ready, aren't we? We're not the finished article. We're, we're not polished and beautiful. But in God's sight, we're able to make spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So in Christ, we're made perfect. Now, it reminds me of a holiday I had in the Channel Islands. So I visited the Alderney Lighthouse. I guess it's like many other lighthouses, I don't know. But it was made of stones, so it's applicable here. We're talking about stones being built into a, a spiritual building. Well, this lighthouse was made of stones, and inside there was a rather scary winding <coughs> staircase. Start at the bottom, and the, the stairs went round the outside. It was inside, but went round the outside wall of the lighthouse, all the way up to the light at the top. Okay? But, as far as I remember, there was no handrail. So one slip, and you'd fall to your doom, I'm sure. So it was a bit of a scary... Well, the good news was, that day when we went, none of us fell, so we all made it to the top, but one of us made a bit of a fool of himself. Guess who that was? Me. <laughs> uh, because I couldn't figure it out. I was, I was going up, looking, going around this staircase, and all the, all the stone blocks were perfectly symmetrical, and exactly the same size. I thought, oh, is that amazing how they made that? It seemed beyond incredible. But of course, it, they just plastered over all the stones and made them look perfect. And it reminded me of, of Christ here, because it's not a cosmetic thing that Jesus does. He's actually making us perfect, isn't he? The rough and ready, raggedy stones are being made into these perfect stones. Christ is doing that for us. We're perfect in Christ. There's one final thing in these verses as we kind of draw to a conclusion. We've got this Christ church we're thinking about, this spiritual building. It's, it's magnificently glorious. There's this perfect foundation, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and we're the living stones, ever-expanding temple. We're serving as holy priests, honouring God day and night, representing the King of Kings. There can be no higher honour so we rejoice as God's believing people. The honour, remember that verse, the amazing verse, the honour is for you who believe. We can't overstate the privileges of coming to Christ in faith. The honour we have. But how does verse 7 conclude? There's this solemn warning. If you don't want the blessings, then you won't have the blessings. For those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So their decision to reject Christ, it didn't in any way thwart God's plan. They rejected him as the cornerstone, but God nevertheless chose Jesus as the cornerstone. So we mustn't miscalculate. John Brown in his commentary says, don't miscalculate. I thought that was a good word. Um, and he gives an example of Voltaire, who apparently, according to John Brown, in his boastful arrogance, he set himself against Christ's church. 
represented by the apostles. He said this, one wise man, referring to himself, would undo what 12 fools had done. That's disparaging, isn't it? What happened to those 12 so-called fools? The, the, the church is built on the, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and that church is growing and continuing to grow. But where's Voltaire? Dead and buried. But Christ's church unfalteringly prospers. Now, these people, was it just a, when they stumbled, was it a slight misfortune? I just miscalculated. I didn't quite get things right. Now, I personally made a miscalculation a few weeks ago, and uh, I think it's something to do with an age thing, because I decided to jump up. It must have been about three, three or four steps. I don't know. I thought I can easily jump those, those steps, but I miscalculated by about a millimetre. Okay? So I hit the top of the, whatever it was, the steps, and fell flat on my face and scraped my hands. And to be honest, it was quite painful for about a minute or two. But a kind 10-year-old lad came along, and he helped me up and got my things and put them back in my pockets. And I was all right. And uh, all the scars have, have well disappeared. So is that what we're talking about in verse 8, about this, this stone of stumbling? It will trip us up a bit. It might be painful for a while, but there are no long-term implications. Is that what we have in this picture? Well, all of us, if we're not Christians, we see Jesus lying across our path. We meet him all the time. We meet him in his word, if we're listening. We meet him in the preaching. We meet him in our conscience. Jesus obstructs our way, the way we want to go. And what are we going to do? We don't want Jesus. Like these, if you don't want Jesus, like these builders that rejected the cornerstone, what would you think? Well, maybe if you just tiptoe and quietly step over him. He might not notice. Is that what we have here? Well, if Jesus isn't the foundation of, a, of your life, you can't just ignore him. You can't just tiptoe past him. We're told he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. So if you miscalculate with Christ, down you'll come. Not a minor bump, but a cataclysmic crash. Lenski in his commentary brings out the, the full force of the original. He says, striking that rock is so dreadful, it will knock out your brains. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Why do people disobey? They disobey because they disbelieve. They don't take God's word seriously. I'll be fine. And yet we're warned and warned and warned again. You have to believe. It's everything or nothing. All these blessings, the blessings of the living stones or the catastrophe of stumbling to everlasting ruin. The heights of heaven or the depths of despair. It's one or the other. Well, we started with a Bob Dylan track, so we'll end with one. He confesses another song. He says, how weak was the foundation I was standing upon. As an unbeliever, that's what you've got. You've got an uncertain, you're standing on a sand, an uncertain foundation. You haven't got the cornerstone. He didn't have Christ. And then he says this, you've either got faith or you've got unbelief and there ain't neutral ground. It's striking, isn't it? You can't be half and half. You either believe and are blessed gloriously or you don't believe and it's everlasting ruin. You stumble on that rock of offence. So which do you have? Do you have faith or unbelief makes all the difference. So you need to come. That's where the verse has started in, in verse 4. It started with the word come. As you come to him, we need to come to Jesus in faith. Join his remarkable spiritual building and then we'll be, we'll be abundantly blessed. We'll be priests, we'll be serving, we'll be active. It'll be a wonderful, glorious preparation for the eternal worship of heaven to come. So what must we do? We must trust. So we'll conclude by singing a, a, a wonderful hymn of trust. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. Come to Jesus, trust him, put your faith in him and be abundantly blessed. 577.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.